Thank you, David. Our next speaker is uh, Louisa Marsh from uh, LGC Forensics um, out of the UK. Uh, we welcome her and she will be talking to us um, uh, about airbag dust. The name of her uh, paper is Bang Goes the Airbag, Using Dust from Deep Void Airbags as Trace Material in Automotive Cars. Thank you, good morning. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for the opportunity to talk to you today about my research and for attending my talk. Like every good story, there's a, a beginning, a middle and an end. And um, as a, a bench caseworker, as most of you guys are, um, it started really with a, with a problem. Um, cases were coming in um, to try and identify whether somebody was a, a, a driver in a vehicle um, at the point of an impact. Now, traditional techniques generally look at whether you can tie someone to an airbag that's detonated, for example, by looking for things like fibres or hairs or even blood um, and uh, maybe fingerprints <coughs> um, with, the, with the point to try and identify whether someone was actually the driver or the passenger in a vehicle at a point of an impact. But there are some issues and some problems with this, um, although they're fairly routine. Um, there has been a study that showed in 20% of cases there was no usable DNA from airbags um, which had exploded. And this generally is, is not because there is a poor technique, it's generally because um, they're complex mixtures. Airbags are not packed in clean environments. And so quite often when they detonate, um, you end up with a mixture coming off. The other problem with cases in such as this type are when there are um, suspects who have prior legitimate access to a vehicle. So maybe it's their car, or maybe that they have been allowed to drive it in the past. And the next logical step, really, for us was to look at the airbag debris itself. Um, anyone that's ever um, examined airbags themselves can't fail to notice the fact that they're extremely dirty items when you pick them up. They've got, they've got a lot of dust on them. And that dust is actually spent propellant. And um, being a trace person at heart, um, I realized that this is going to be a good target, really. Moving on to some of the background, if you have a look at the picture here, uh, the picture on the left, this is a typical driver's airbag that's been detonated. And um, I draw your attention to the fact that the middle of the airbag um, actually has some stitching in it. And when I embarked on this research, I didn't know how important that stitching was going to be. So this particular one has red stitching. Now, I've spoken to lots of people who work in the airbag industry. And they tell me that the stitching on airbags is, is there um, purely to identify, in terms of colour, you know, which airbags they're putting in vehicles. And the colours are random. So some are pink, some are blue, some are green, and some are red. And they also use different dye techniques um, to dye these particular airbag stitches. The, the, the picture on the, on the right is actually a, a passenger airbag um, that um, had been... Um, unfolded, so that particular one hadn't detonated. A little bit more background. Um, I'm sure people are very aware of the fact that airbags are, are designed as safety features in vehicles. The whole idea is that uh, as uh, a collision occurs, you actually ride down on these airbags, so your, your face and your body sort of essentially uh, are cushioned by the airbag, and they inflate extremely fast and in an extremely hot manner. And uh, there have been some, some great papers published which look at the scorch marks on clothing or on skin of people who've come into contact with exploding airbags. So that's always another technique that could be used if you're trying to tie someone up to an airbag themselves. This is a, a busy slide, and I'm not going to go through all the background, um, but quite often um, people assume that airbags are packed with cornstarch or talc. And that's actually a very old technique now. The original airbags back in the early 90s uh, used lubricating powders to try and stop the lining from sticking to it. So the old-fashioned idea of people sort of looking as if they've had um, sort of bags of flour thrown at their chest when they've been in an accident, you could still find, but they would be extremely old vehicles. Nowadays, modern airbags tend to have um, silicon lining on the inside and no neoprene lining, so... The, the need for um, lubrication has, has gone down. Uh, needless to say that each individual airbag going off is a pyrotechnic explosion and hence has starting materials, 
and spent propellant, and um, it, it is it, quite an explosion, actually. I don't know if anyone's ever been in the misfortune to have to come into contact with an airbag at, at the business end, so to speak. But they uh, they really you know they really go bang. They're they're very um, very forceful explosions. So what what e what particles are produced? Well. The uh, manufacturers tend to be very cagey about letting you know what they put into their airbags. So there are um, commonalities between airbags with starting materials, but they also often add sort of special ingredients that they, they don't like to tell you about. But the most important thing I found out during my research is that the starting materials is really only the first part of the story, because um, in any good reaction, as proper chemists know, it's the um, environmental issues that also have an effect on that particular explosion. So, in my opinion, every airbag going off really is a unique explosion. So if you took 100 airbags with the same starting materials, it is quite likely that you will end up with slightly different um, particles coming out at the end, because each one really would be a different temperature, a different pressure. There has been some research done in the past. There's been some excellent papers studied. I've um, added some references at the end of this talk, um, looking at airbag debris from the point of GSR. So studies have shown that um, particles produced during airbags exploding um, actually are very similar to GSR particles, down to one or two microns. And um, in, in some instances, it's not possible to tell the difference between these GSR particles from an airbag and a GSR particle, perhaps that's come from a firearm. And uh, one paper actually noted that they had not seen any such thing as a, a unique airbag particle. That's really the background to, to where we was going. We had the opportunity to conduct some research. Um, and unfortunately, my company um, couldn't quite rise to buying vehicles and crashing them, although I did try <laughs> and ask. Um, but uh, we, we went to the next, uh, the next possibility, which is to attend our local scrapyard found um, a very helpful scrapyard who actually detonated the airbags for us. And that gave us a unique opportunity to, teach each in, to treat each individual vehicle as a separate experiment. And they're actually deployed using a nine volt battery, so you sort of rip the housing off underneath the steering wheel. And uh, the e uh, um, engineer was able to deploy the airbag while we were standing and watching. And um, if you've never seen these things go off, they really do go off with a bang and um, they sort of um, smoke for ages, extreme heat. We had to stand well back because I am told that they can take glass out as well when they go off. Because we were able to treat each individual one as an experiment, we actually were also able to leave open tape lifts on the seats to try and capture the powder as it moved around the vehicle at the point of detonation. And we also SEM stubbed the inside of the vehicle before, during, uh, before and afterwards. And unfortunately, those particular SEM stubs haven't been processed yet. So I know a lot of you guys are GSR experts, and I'm afraid that really is beyond the scope of this particular talk. Then once the airbag had deflated and wasn't so hot, so I wasn't going to burn myself, I then taped the front of the airbag. And the point of that really was at that point, the airbag was still in situ. It hadn't been in contact with the inside of the vehicle. And so by taping the front of the, the, the actual airbag, I was going to try and gather some information about what kind of extraneous fibers or other extraneous material were actually present on the airbag after it exploded, before it had come into contact uh, with the vehicle. I'm guessing those, you, uh, those of you who are caseworkers, if you get items in, you, you often don't know the story behind what's happened to it. And obviously, this was a un unique opportunity to know exactly what's happened to my item. Once we taped the front of the airbags, we were then able to cut the airbags out and forensically bag them. And uh, we actually undergone und underwent a couple of experiments where we were able to put dummies in the front seats as well to see what happened to the clothing that they were wearing. And again, unfortunately, those clothing items haven't been processed yet, so that's a story for the future. If you have a look at picture number one, this is um, a, a photograph after the airbags exploded and when I half cut it out. So it shows the back of the steering wheel. Picture number two is the open tape lift behind the steering wheel itself. So I was able to capture some of the particles as they, uh, as they flew around the vehicle. Number three is the open tapes on the back of the seat. And I actually put the open tapes on the passenger seat and the driver's seat to try and um, gather some information about how far these particles were flying. 
And number four shows a couple of the dummies that we put in the seats um, in two experiments, and they were wearing brightly colored T-shirts with the idea that we could try and find out if those uh, fibers on those T-shirts turned up on the airbags. Once the airbags had actually been cut out of the vehicle, we uh, got out the rain because it was chucking it down that day, went back to the laboratory and actually opened up the items and tipped all the dust out from the inside of the airbag. And anyone that's ever looked at these airbags will realize that they are really, really dusty. And it's immediately obvious that there's a huge difference in the dust that's coming out of them. And there's uh, just four descriptions here, of uh, four photographs here of some of the Petri dishes um, that we tipped out. And they really range from, um, you know, dark, dark black carbon material down to sort of, sort of white fluffy material. So there was a huge range there. And then going back to simple light microscopy techniques, um, all the dust was um, looked at with a low power microscope to identify what on earth we'd got here. And having identified the morphology of these particular particles, we started to move on to high power techniques, so polarized light microscopes. Um, and also what fluorescent effects were going on. Alongside looking at the uh, scrapyard samples, we also had the opportunity to collect some dust from real casework samples. So this uh, results table here shows some of those casework samples themselves. And the dust in these was actually processed alongside the, uh, the airbag, the airbags that we took from the scrapyard. Um, all uh, vehicles have um, round airbags in the driver's seat, thank you. Round airbags in the driver's seat and rectangular airbags in the passenger seat. And um, moving on to the scrapyard samples, um, again, we started noting whether there was linings in the actual vehicle airbags themselves. Quite often what was happening was that there was no lining at all or there was a sort of a central lining over the front of the airbag. You remember the first photograph I showed you with the red stitching on the inside? On the, on the back of that red stitching is actually a partial lining. So quite a lot of the airbags that we saw had these, these partial linings. We didn't have a choice over the vehicles that we chose. Um, unfortunately, um, we, we were very um, tied by what vehicles were available to us. I mean, the scrapyard that we attended um, the vehicles were sort of all higgledy-piggledy and on top of each other, and it became a safety issue. So really, we, we exploded whatever airbags we could safely get at. Uh, we weren't too picky, but it did mean that we were sort of almost stuck with the older type vehicles. So it was a real, it was a real range of, of um, vehicles that we ended up with. So my results, by looking at all the individual um, dust particles that we got off, uh, we started to identify what, I, what I've termed as forms. And um, rather than looking at the GSR size particles, the one or two microns that uh, David was talking about, I really went for the, the big boys, really. Anything that I could pick up with a pair of tweezers and manipulate onto glass slides. Um, so really between sort of 40 microns and up to, up to 600 microns, really, were the, were the ranges that we saw. And I identified 50 different forms, 50 different mo morphological forms that I would be comfortable under low power stereo microscope as saying were different, were different from each other. Um, all these dust forms were actually analyzed using um, polarizing microscopy. And one of the interesting points that I noticed is that virtually none of them exhibited any biorefringence. And thinking that through, that makes perfect sense to me because as part of the pyrotechnic ex explosion, these forms are being created extremely un under extreme heat and are then cooling extremely fast. So there's no crystallinity forming. So that actually kind of made sense to me. Many of these different forms cropped up again and again um, in different airbags. But um, of all the airbags that we looked at, none of them had exactly the same ratios. And often there was maybe three or four forms in one airbag, but perhaps in another airbag we were seeing maybe 20 different forms. So there was a, an enormous variation between the airbag dust themselves. One of the most distinctive and interesting forms I saw is, is what I've described as worms. Um, and that's exactly what they look like, small glass, glassy-like materials that contain air bubbles. And they, they are very worm-like. And uh, we kept seeing those again and again. They kept cropping up in the, uh, in the debris. And they kept cropping up in different colors. I'm going back to the beginning of my talk where I was talking about 
how important the coloured stitching was, it took a while to cotton on to the fact that there was quite a lot of correlation between the colour of these glassy-like worms and the colour of the stitching that was, was actually on the airbag itself. Preliminary results from the tapes inside the airbag are indicating that approximately half the level of dust from the exploding airbag is reaching the passenger side as the driver's side. So although that's expected, it is a limitation because I don't think we would ever be comfortable saying if someone's got dust on them that they were definitely the driver because knowing that the dust is flying around the vehicle means sitting as a passenger they would also pick that up. So that is a limitation of this, uh, of this procedure. Having a lining inside each, each airbag as well did reduce the amount of debris, obviously. There's, uh, there's less being um, thrown outside uh, the airbag itself. But in every single airbag, we did end up with a significant quantity of, uh, of debris, at least half a teaspoon from each airbag. So this pyrotechnic explosion is producing spent particles in every case that we looked at. With one exception, we had one airbag um, that we took from the scrapyard that hadn't detonated, and that became a lovely control because obviously there was no particles inside that for us. So moving on to some of the forms that we saw, I'll, I'll run through these fairly quickly. Um, the most common form that we saw was this, this sort of flat particle, this silver-grey particle, and that turned up in almost half the airbags. And there's nothing really particularly special about that one. And uh, although it was there, um, you know, I wouldn't put any inference on the fact that it was there um, because it was so common. The bottom left form, obviously, is the, um, is the glassy light worm that I was talking about. And that turned up in six out of the 24, 23 airbags that we looked at in total. I'm going to skim through quickly the next slide, just to show you, that's two slides, just to show you here some of the correlations that we noted between the airbag stitching and these forms themselves. And um, my hypothesis, as, as yet untested, and I'm very interested to see what you guys think, is that the dye actually in the airbag stitching was sublimating at the point of impact and getting caught in the, in the formation of these worms. So um, I think this is going to be, of all my results, this is going to be potentially the most diagnostic. And it came up again and again. The one at the top, this Toyota had blue stitching. We ended up with blue worms, orange stitching, orange worms. And it was a correlation that we saw again and again. So just, um, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to run out of time th to go through this. But um, this is uh, just showing some of the, um, some of the fibres that we actually found on the front of the airbag and uh, there was a significant number. And there was also hairs cropping up on this as well. <coughs> so just to, uh, as a conclusion, dust was produced in every, single, um, in every single deployed airbag. The dust recovered was distinctive and was searchable with a low-powered microscope and a pair of tweezers. The color of the stitching was extremely important because of the possible sublimation of the dye coming out of that. I think that it's fair to call each explosion a unique detonation and subsequently it's not unusual to expect what you end up with varying slightly in each individual case. What we were finding is best actually to shake the items of clothing to recover the debris because in trace terms these things are quite big. I wouldn't recommend taping them because the adhesive does actually distort them. We did find a significant number of fibres on the front of the airbag because these things are not um, packed in clean environments. And that's something just to be careful if you're trying to use fibre evidence to link them. And of course, the limitation. Um, I would never be comfortable saying someone was the driver simply because we know that this dust moves around the inside of the vehicle. And again, this, uh, the distinctive forms show melting and, and, uh, and heating, melting and cooling, rapid cooling. And um, as expected, um, this shows very little biorefringence. I have included um, a, a case study, which um, will be available on the website if you would like to have a look um, after the end of the, of the conference. Unfortunately, I haven't got time to go through it here. But um, this, the results of my, of my research have actually been used in anger in about four or five cases now and actually have been accepted in court in the UK. Um, so it act actually adds quite a nice validity to the story. And, um, you know, if you'd like to catch me after, after this uh, session, I'm more than happy to show you this particular case study if you are interested.
one final, uh, one final slide. I'd just like to say a massive thank you to my two students who've been squirreling away for the last couple of years on this, uh, on this project. Emma Kelly, who was my student at, back in 2000, and Jack da Gallagher, who's uh, been working away this summer on it. So I'd like to say a massive thank you to them for the processing of all the, uh, all the different forms. Obviously, it's been an enormous amount of work. And um, obviously, I'd like to say thank you to you guys very much for listening to my presentation. <laughs>